Ladies and gentlemen, I think our speaker is precisely who General Harris was thinking of when he defined the Wings Club Psych Lecture as an expression of an age-old need to review accomplishments in light of man's experience. It is my high honor and great pleasure to welcome General Duncan McNabb to our podium. Well, Dave, uh, thanks for that introduction. And uh, I know they're serving dessert and all the, uh, and, and you know, some of you all are still eating, so please feel free. It's not going to bother me. I just, as I told uh, both uh, Ken and Dave, is that, you know, I came here just to spend some time with you, and I, I'd, I'd like to take all that I can, uh, because I think this is a very important time in our history, and I think we have a, a story that I think uh, will resonate with you, because many of the folks in this room, when I look around, I've got a lot of friends that have been in the middle of of building what I would tell you is one of the greatest asymmetric advantages our country has, which is our strategic ability to move. And uh, th so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about that, but uh, so please keep eating, enjoy your dessert. Um, I'm gonna probably, as they clear, is kind of walk out there uh, be amongst you, because that'll keep me moving, which is, which is good, because I'm gonna be sitting in traffic on the way back. Uh, and, and I love being here because they got a lot of work for me to do back home, and I'm not going home. So this is working out. This is working out well. Um, Dave, I understand you and Jeff uh, Niddle were just uh, recognized by Embry Riddle uh, for the Eagle of Excellence Award. So I would just tell you congratulations on that. Um, when I think about uh, being here, uh, Bill Flynn, about was that about four months ago, maybe five months ago, Bill said, w "Hey, would you think about uh, coming out here and?" And, uh, and talking to the, uh, the Wings Club. Now, the part he didn't mention was it would be during Fleet Week. So I just throw that out, uh, Bill. We hadn't quite got that logistics uh, part you know, you know, put out there, but I will just say that what a great time when you think about this coming up on Memorial Day. So actually, it works out perfectly when, you know, when I think about that. Um, and so I am very honored you know, when I think about uh, the Wings Club and its rich history and all the great all the great speakers that you have had over, over the time. And uh, Herb Kelleher, I got to be with him last Thursday, and he, t he was a site lecturer a couple, three, four years ago, maybe five, who is a great friend, but you know, he, he, just, uh, he always talks about his time in places like this and be able to tell a story about this great love that all of us have, this great passion of aviation. So uh, with that, what I thought I would do is uh, start off a little bit, given that it's Memorial Day, and talk a little bit about 9-11. Whenever I come to New York City, whenever you, know, you end up seeing where the Twin Towers were, whenever you pass by Ground Zero, you must remember. It always hits me, and I'm always, I will tell you, I'm always overwhelmed. Um, you know, one of my... When I first came, came out and saw that, you know, and, and seeing the firemen and, and, you know, going by and seeing uh, the police department and talking to some of those great heroes uh, of that day, um, you know, it, it, can't, it can't but move you. Um, when I think about our great guys out at there, you know, I look out there, the guys at Stewart, you know, who I remember flying in, who lost a number uh, of members uh, that, you know, they were guard members at Stewart. And I remember going by the memorial there at Stewart to the folks that died on 9-11. And again, I'd like to, from the wing commander and then those great airmen that are out there, I'd like to give you all a big round of applause for what you do every day, keeping everything flying. I look over here and I see ROTC students at, uh, from Manhattan. Do I have that right? Man so I would just tell you, great to have you here. And what an exciting life this is, to, you know, whether you decide to, you know, to sign up for a shorter period or a longer period, I will tell you, your life will forever be changed. It is something that uh, hopefully we'll talk a little bit about today. And, and again, as I get in and think about 9-11 and being with so many old friends, so many people that have played such a large part in all this and defending our country, uh, I really am moved by all of that. Um, so let me begin and think about what happened just about three weeks ago. So on 1 May, when uh, Osama bin Laden was found and taken care of, 
I would just say that um, one of the most moving tributes uh, to that whole, all that went into that, was by a sister of one of the victims that had died in the Twin Towers when she said, I take great gratification that the last thing that Osama bin Laden did on this earth is look and say, the Americans have come. Almost 10 years to bring him to justice. Four years from the break in which every part of our government came together, from the intel folks to our special operators, all sorts of people working together to try to figure out where he was, and culminating in the SEAL team saying, Geronimo, we have him. 9-11. When you think about 9-11, you all know where you were. It especially hits hard when you're sitting in New York City. Because every day you miss those Twin Towers, a constant reminder. And I know that I was in the building um, in the Pentagon. I uh, was... If the airline hit here, I was right around the corner on this side, on the second, on the, uh, second corridor, uh, probably 300, 400 feet away. I remember feeling the shutter. I remember having the fire alarms go off. I remember uh, how everybody helped everybody else as, uh, as we evacuated the building. I remember standing out in the south parking lot as one by one, my, I was a two-star then, and one by one my, my um, division chiefs, the colonels that worked for me, saying, I have everybody accounted for but one. I've got everybody accounted for but two. And I stood there in the south parking lot as each one reported, and within about five minutes, we had been very lucky and had not lost anyone. And I remember that day... You know, I remember calling on my cell phone uh, to my wife and saying, uh, please let all of the families know that we've accounted for everybody in XP. See if you can get hold of my boss, the three star, and tell him that you've got hold of, you know, I've got hold of you and you can get hold of him and see if you can pass on that we've got everybody accounted for. And, uh, and about that time, just as we're you're trying to work through all of that part, they came and they said, you've got to clear the parking lot because there's another airline coming in. I remember that, you know, as we're all sitting there and they go, you've got to get out of here because this is such a great target. And so we started to clear and they said, you all go home. Pentagon is burning and you all need to go ahead and cross the road. We said, okay, everybody go home. We'll get hold of you. And about that time, a beautiful Air National Guard F-16 rocketed overhead, came out of the Andrews, the DC guard came out of Andrews Air Force Base and it was on scene. That airplane that was uh, headed our way was the one that went down in Pennsylvania. As, uh, as you remember, that, that, that plane, those passengers aboard that plane and the great call of let's roll because we are not gonna let them do this. About this time, as I'm starting to you know, move, move out, I remember thinking, I started getting angry. And I wasn't as angry about the Pentagon because after all, that was a military target. But the Pentagon, but, but the Twin Towers, the Twin Towers was the wanton killing of innocent men, women, and children that I, like everybody in uniform, had sworn to protect. And you know that day that instead of killing 3,000, they could have killed 30,000, or 300,000, or 3 million. They'd have done it. And you all know that they would do it today. And Osama bin Laden said that over and over and over again. This really is a battle about the future of mankind. It's not the first battle for the future of mankind our country has stepped up to. But this is our time. This is our time. It really is a battle about good over evil, 
about hope over despair, of light over darkness, of freedom over tyranny. And just like before, when the country said, who shall we send, who will go for us, they had all these great young Americans from all parts of the country, very diverse backgrounds, who raised their hand and said, here I am, send me. These are the folks back there from the Stewart Guard, ROTC folks that have said, here I am, send me. And today, 10 years later, every person that serves in this all-volunteer force, which is a little bit different because when you had a draft, you didn't have as much of a choice. You now have an all-volunteer force that they have said, I know what I'm getting into. I raised my hand for freedom. And this is their time. So on Sunday, 1 May, we sent an unmistakable message to our potential enemies. If you attack, dare attack our people, or you attack our freedom, we will come, and we will change your world. And all you have to do is ask Saddam Hussein, or Osama bin Laden, or before Hitler, or Toho, or Milosevic, we will come and we will change your world. So when I think about that, what a great signal that I in the military want to send. Now on the other side of that is this same capability is what allows us to come to the aid of friends and allies that have disasters, floods and tsunamis, nuclear disasters, earthquakes. That same ability is what allows us to do that. And being the, the Transcom commander, I love the fact that we do a lot more of the taking and helping and showing the compassion of the American people than we do saying, if you cross some lines, we will come and we will change your world. We have the greatest military in the world today. But their most outstanding attribute is their compassion. Whenever you go to Bethesda or Walter Reed, whenever you go see one of our wounded warriors, they will not tell you how they got hurt. Not until you ask them. But they will tell you about a family that they touched. They will talk about a child. They will talk about their wingman. They will talk about a buddy that they, they worked together and they did something great. They put themselves on the line so that others might live. So this truly is the next greatest generation. I will just tell you, this is their time, and they have stepped up absolutely superbly. Just like those that have gone on before, they've ridden to the sound of the gun, they've been tested under fire, and they've been found worthy. And they know, they know that they have made a difference. They know that they've put themselves on the line so that others might live. Um, and when we think about the, great, the greatest generation in World II, it was how humble they were about what they had done. But boy, they never told you what they did. That's the part that always hits me. And whenever we honor a bunch of folks, they always say, well, you shouldn't honor me. There's so many other people that should be honored. I mean, I'm just, I was just part of a team. Every time, from Medal of Honor winners all the way down, Bronze Stars, any time you talk to them, they go, no, no, it wasn't me. It was all these folks. And there's a... Chaplain Baldwin, when we did the uh, Air Force Memorial, said a great thing. He said, you know, when it's the darkest is when the stars come out. The stars are always there, but when it is dark is when the stars come out, and that's what's happened. It is huge. I, I was down in, I was down in uh, Brook Army Medical Center uh, down in San Antonio where we take care of the wounded, especially the ones in the, that uh, are stationed in the west, uh, it is our outstanding burn patient uh, center, probably the most outstanding burn patient center in the world. But it also takes care of folks that uh, new, need new limbs. And I remember going down there and visiting, and I'll never forget that this was uh, first visit in the burn, burn station. Then I, then I went over to meet some of the folks that had uh, lost uh, a leg. And one, one guy has just come back from running on his two new legs. 
two new legs. And he was in great mood, you know, probably an E7, great guy. And he comes in, big smile, I go, I go, hey, you know, how, how's it going? And he goes, oh, he says, I just had the greatest run. It's great. I've challenged the president of the United States to a race, and I'm going to kick his tail. <laughs> and he, since then, he has run, uh, this was with President Bush, and he has since done that. And then, I, then there was another one, a young Marine, probably 18, 19, 18, 19. And this young 18, 19-year-old, uh, he was on his, on his new leg, and you could tell he had just gotten it. And so he's trying to get his balance right. He's trying to get the muscles to work. He's really concentrating. Sweat's coming down. And you, I mean, you can just feel how hard he's working at this. And I look at this young Marine, and I said, thank you. And this young Marine kind of looked over at me and kind of quizzical. And he says, sir, you, you, you don't need to thank me. He says, I'm going to live to a ripe old age. And all of the people that I love, my family and my friends, and all of the generations to come will live in freedom because of what I and my fellow warriors are doing. I am proud to serve my country. 18 years old, talking about generations to come. I know that when I was 18, I did not talk about generations to come. So I would just say, that's who's out there today and defending it. So I would just say, that's what's going on. And when I think about this Memorial Day, and I think about the folks that have given that last full measure, that raised their hand for freedom, but I would say that recognition of how great this young, all these young folks are. I mean, I, don't, I never worry about where this country's going. These folks are magnificent. And, and, and you know, they walk differently. They know they've made a difference. So I would just say let our friends and allies know that we will be there in their times of need and let our potential adversaries know if you put our nation at risk or you attack our people, we will come and we will preserve this torch of freedom that is the hope of mankind. This time, when you think about this city and what this means, we've never been in better hands than with these young folks who have signed up and served and raised their hand for freedom. So God bless you. Oh, oh I'm not done yet. I'm going to talk a little bit about how Transcom does this. Now, Transcom is the bridge. If you think about the bridge, you think about the air bridge, you think about the surface bridge, you think about the tanker bridge, you think about the aeromedical bridge. So when I, when I go through that and you think about uh, what that means to a guy like General Petraeus or General Mattis or Admiral Stavridis or Admiral Willard in the Pacific, they are betting that we're going to give them the lifelines that they need to be able to carry out the, the operations that uh, the president gives them. So that's what Transcom jobs, job really is. And so I, as I tell them, I go, you know, my, my part in all of this uh, is, in fact, if I'm doing it right, you never worry about this. You never worry about whether or not you're going to have the movement of the forces or sustaining the forces as we go. So with that, let me just say, go ahead, next slide. So here's what Transcom does. And there's a couple of things that I think are very important when you think about Transcom, because you think about all of our military equipment, but it is, in fact, our US flag flag fleet, both our air and our surface. And many of our air carriers who do such a great job on our Civil Reserve Air Fleet, they are the ones that are able to be able to respond. And it is their networks that have made a huge difference in our ability to take place, take care of a place like Afghanistan. So with that, let me, uh, let me go through this. Okay, so just very quickly, requirement. Requirement comes in to a combatant commander that's out there in the theater. You can think about General Petraeus, you can think about General Mattis. They're given a mission and by the president, and they figure out what they need and when they need it. They say, here's what I need to do that mission. Some of those forces they may have in place. Some of those forces may be back in the states that we need to send to them. They then put that into as a request, and they say, here's what I need. And that comes to us, and we take what they say, here's, here's kind of how it all fits together. We put it in transportation form, and then we pass it to our components for execution. 
And it used to be fairly simple. If it was air, we gave it to the Air Mobility Command. If it was surface, we gave it to our, our, uh, both our sea and our ground folks to work together. But today it's gotten much more, much, much different than that because what we do now is we do combinations. We do a combination of surface and air. We do a combination of military and commercial. And we're doing multimodal solutions in real time because you save big dollars. And then you're matching the asset to what you need done. Works out superbly. So one of the things that, I, that uh, we have done during this, this time is figure out how to better and better do this. And our US flag carriers, again, have just been wonderful in how they've done this. And as they've brought on new modern airplanes, if they brought on new modern ships and different pr uh, principles, they've said, here's what we can do for you. And then it frees up military assets to go do other things. So, and what this is all based on, go ahead, is trust. And I'll just say, probably the coin of any realm is trust. And if you're doing this right, and they know you'll be there, it's amazing what you can get done. So we spend a lot of time not only taking what these guys can do, but going back and saying to the different combatant commanders, can I slow you down a little bit so I can use some of that force that I was going to have moving your stuff? I'd like to slow down a little bit and be able to speed up over here. Um, you just saw it this last May. Um, in, in a very big way, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, on down the road, but I would say that the part that really hits you is your ability to pivot this enterprise as you need to. And again, our U.S. flag carriers give me a huge ability to expand and then contract as we need to and still free up our military stuff where I have to use military. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Here's kind of how we're made up, but I'll say uh, I, I talk about our three components. You know, our surface component, our, our sea component, and our air component, I will say this commercial industry is huge for us. When we put up on the right, here's how, how big we are. This is the military side. If I took 56 billion assets, that's the military assets. When I take the, the sea lift side, uh, is estimated about 50 billion, and I don't know, Bill, you probably helped me on the air side, but when you think about 900 aircraft, it's probably to the 50 to 100 billion dollar range. So when you talk about the value of that to me, it's amazing because I don't have to own that. That's our U.S. industry. And when we give them a mission, it's good for them, it's good for the jobs, but it also frees up our military to do some other stuff. Uh, 14 billion in revenue, I will just say that uh, last year we saved about $3 billion in this enterprise. So not bad. I think for all the financial folks in, you know, in the room, that's not, not too bad. A lot of that was figuring out where we could use surface rather than taking it by air all the way. We took it by surface for 90% of the way and just used air for the last part where, there were, where the threat required that. Um, this is, the, again, our network. This is all over the world. Um, in many cases, this is a one or two person contract team that supports an embassy run used by our air. It might be a couple of folks at a port where we do ports of call. But this is the, the foundation of whenever we need to expand very rapidly, this is how we do it. And this is in existence all the time. This does not include our US flag fleets and what their network is. When you put that on, then there's no longer a map on there because they've got all of these relationships and they make real magic happen. But 900 sorties a day, I always tell folks, you know, every, you know, every uh, 90 seconds, there's an airplane taking off or landing somewhere in the world with a beautiful US flag on the tail. And uh, I always tell folks that only one of those needs to go wrong to be a CNN moment. And when I, you know, the Secretary of Defense calls me or the chairman calls me and says, what the heck went on there? And I go, you know, the other 899 really went well today. <laughs> they don't care at all how the other 899 went. So we are constantly working to try to make that better. But this, the places that we go, uh, the places that are included in this are places like the resupply of the South Pole and the Antarctic. This is forward operating baits that uh, might be at the very forward point in Afghanistan where we're having to do some special airdrop or into a dirt field uh, called Torn Coat where we're taking care of the Marines in there. Or it could be uh, rapidly moving the crash rescue team from Fairfax County, speeding it to Japan to help with the earthquake or moving boron powder in support of the nuclear problem, the nuclear uh, disaster that happened in Japan, and we're moving a plane load of boron powder. Kind of amazing. You know, I kind of go, so what's boron powder do? 
They said, well, it'd be good. At, we, we can't really t take time to tell you how that works, but if you could airdrop it onto that thing, that might not be too bad. But I would just say, those are the kinds of things that go on, and we got to make sure that that all works. And you can imagine the power of saying, I can use the US flag industry to take care of a lot of this, and then that, again, frees up my military stuff to take care of special things that only military, because of the threat, we can do. So 35 ships at sea, again, the majority of those are uh, US flag carriers. That is not uh, gray bottoms, as you would, uh, you would call them. We will always first use our commercial industry on the sea lift side, always. And then only when they can't handle it do we go ahead and activate a ship. But I'll tell you the difference there, and what really does make a difference, and it just gives you an idea of the power and how well how responsive they've been, we didn't have to activate one ship for the drawdown coming out of Iraq or the surge of forces into Afghanistan last year. Not one ship. They stepped up, they took care of everything, and everything flowed. And again, it just tells you the power of that and how good that has worked and making sure that we can do what's needed. Okay, Transcom, this kind of gives you an idea of what we do over a week. If we were in a full-out Wartime, everything, you know, two theater wars, we would be about three to four times this amount because we'd activate, um, we'd mobilize the Guard and Reserve, the whole team would come on board, and we'd also activate the Silver Reserve Air Fleet and the Visa Fleets, and we'd have, you know, that gives us our full wartime capacity. So up until then, we do it through volunteerism, and we say, you know, can you handle it? Or we ask the Guard and Reserve, hey, can you do this through volunteers? Again, they do superbly at it. But over here on the, on the air side, 38,000 passengers, 28 million pounds of cargo. What's amazing is we move more fuel in the air than we do cargo on the ground. You hear about all the cargo, but we actually move more fuel in the air every day than we move cargo. Uh, sometimes people ask, well, how much fuel, you know, let's get a handle on how much fuel that is. In fact, Art Light and I, you know, we, we use the same analogy of uh, Niagara Falls. But I asked our folks, I, you know, they, we, we move about 5 million pounds a day. And I, I go, well, and then they say, you know, we've moved 10 billion pounds of fuel by, in the air since 9-11. You know, and I go, well, can you give me some idea? I mean, I don't know what 10 billion pounds of fuel looks like. I mean, what, you know, give me a sense. They go, well, if you went around the moon, you know, five times. I go, well, I've never been around the moon. That doesn't mean really much to me. You know, if you, if you flew around the earth, I go, ah, eh, that doesn't mean. They go, ah, have you ever been to Niagara Falls in the summer? All that coming down. If you, stand, if you stood at Niagara Falls, stood there with all that coming down, and you stood there for about 33 minutes straight, that's how much fuel we've moved since 9-11. That's why the new tanker is, we're really excited about the new tanker, because this nation depends on that ability to go global because of those tankers. And not only does that extend our mobility lines, not only does that allow us to bring patients back directly, if, if required, back to the hospital or the doctor where we can save their life or limb. But that's what allows us to keep the fighters and the bombers over the fight. That allows our carrier air to be extended so that we can support Afghanistan from the Gulf, all of those things. So huge on that. Movement of 280 patients, our labor of love, our ability to get folks back if they are harmed. You know, this is one that we've truly transformed. And these folks, all these are medical folks, everything that the medical side has done in support of our wounded warriors has been huge. From the buddy care that's taught by the individual services, how they make sure that within an hour they can get them to a triage center, to the fact that we, will, we have changed the system where we have patient support pallets and critical care teams that we can put on any airplane, and it becomes an AeroVac mission. We do critical care in the air now. We used to not do that. That critical care in the air is saving lives. Uh, back in Vietnam, your chances of getting your, time at, your average time of getting back to the states, back to the hospital in the states, was 40 days. In Desert Shield and Storm, it was 10 days. Today, it's three days. With a stop in Germany, and if we got to bring you all the way home directly, we'll do that with an, with an air refueling on the way back to get you back to the doctor or the hospital. We, we can save your life or limb. This is our promise to the all-volunteer force. This is when we said, if you serve, you raise your hand for freedom, we'll be there for you you and your families. So it's huge, and I would just say what a labor of love that is. To keep that force out there, we're moving six brigade equivalents all the time. So that's that one-to-one -one dwell, so you're always moving teams in, you're moving them out, so when the president says, move 30,000 forces, uh, troops into Afghanistan, this is already on the plate 
to move the six brigades all the time, that flow that's going on. Tina Jonas back there was our comptroller, so I'd always call and say, Tina, I need more money. So I, I would just say, and she was always there, but I would just say, those are the kinds of things that, you know, you, you just realize how, how much is going on all the time. The sea lift side dwarfs the air side. Sea lift costs about a tenth, costs about ten times as much to move stuff by air as it does by surface. About 30 cents a pound by, you know, for, our, for, for my enterprise, it's about 30 cents a pound by surface and about $3 a pound by air. So when you, when you think about that, that's when we make those decisions of how do we mix and match this because every time you do a better job of tailoring your resources to the requirement, you save big dollars for the department. So we work that very hard. Uh, when I look at, you know, this is what our command center looks, looks like. Uh, in our TACC, this is the air side. We've kind of superimposed the sea lift side on, but they've got their own picture, but just gives you an idea of the enterprise. And this what allows us that if there is somebody that gets injured, we can immediately figure out within that system which airplane can we go ahead and bring in there to be able to be the air vac. Drop your stuff, you're now the air vac mission, we're now going to take you home. So it really does pay big dividends. Um, two parts that I do with the enterprise that I say velocity. Now velocity for a lot of portions of this, air specifically will normally mean can you make it move faster? Can you save time on the ground? Can you can you, you know, can, you, can you fly the proper speed? Can we make sure you don't go into holding? Can we basically make your time in the air absolutely pristine? Uh, a lot of times I use the example that, you know, it is your time on the ground that is the one that taxes you the most. And uh, you win your race, actually, in the pits. You know, you don't win because you go 222 versus 221. You, you win it because you cut your pit time versus your opponent. Kind of like, remember the movie Cars? Zing, 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 Guido. Guido saved the day. Zing, zing, zing. That's what the air side. I remember Herb Kelleher, I taught, mentioned him. I, I always use his as my example of Herb was talking about how they reduced ground times in Southwest Airlines. I mean, you've all been there. You've seen how they did that. And they really went after that in a big way. They said, we can, we can block in. We can you know, get everybody off the airplane. We can clean it. And we can put everybody back on and be back out of blocks. And, and I said, well, Herb, how, how, you know, what were you... You know, what did you get to when you were really trying? What did you think you could get to, and how, how close did you get? He said, well, I think we thought that we could get 12-minute turn time on the ground. Can you all, you know, just imagine 12 minutes? I said, well, what would you get to? He said, well, 16. And I go, ah. He said, yeah, but then everybody complained that we were moving the airplane, you know, while people were still standing up. <laughs> so... Herb said, and so I said, well, I'm not the only one that does that. Everybody moves the airplanes when everybody's standing up. So that's why you have every time you, you know, on an airplane, they say, we cannot move the airplane until everybody sits down, right? So that, that came from that period. Now, Herb said the second part to that was, you know, by the way, in my own defense, when we did move, they did sit down. I always liked that. <laughs> you know, I always thought that, you know, Hadn't lost one person all that time. But that's velocity. So I would just say, now, for the surface side, in many cases, this means slow and steady. This means being able to measure that flow so you slow it down when you've got to make room for some other high-priority stuff. So metering this and getting the proper velocity across the enterprise is what's important here because, in many cases, you have some very small gates to get through. Okay, now how do you do that? You do that with precision. You do that with metrics. You do that with good command and control. You do that with making sure that as you sit there and, and go back and say, I've got visibility on what's moving, and I always use visibility. I use uh, FedEx. Where's our FedEx, guys? Aha, right here. Okay, so FedEx, I can use UPS too, but I'll, I, you, you know. But I always say, when, I, when, I, when you guys do, when, when all of us do next day mail and we say, hey, we FedExed it or UPSed it, I'll just be fair here, you know, to make sure we've got it. You know, how many of you all check to make sure that that thing, you know you can track it. How many of you all track it and say, yep, it's on the way? And if you do track it, I'd say you got to get a life. Because <laughs> in general, the way to do that is the time you need to check it is if it doesn't get there. So that's what I do. Now, I will say that your ability to do next day just has allowed me to procrastinate on every single thing I do now. I just say you've, ruined, you've basically made it worse for me. So I just throw that out. My bad habit has gotten worse now that I know I can depend on you all to catch me back up. But they changed it because of the trust, because you can watch it, you can see it, and in general, 
you, I mean, all the times I've had something next day mailed, it makes it. I haven't figured out how you do it, but it's, it's awesome. But that's what we want to do. We want to be able to say, you can trust this system because you'll be able to see it. So lots of work being done on that and then being able to figure out how do we do these levers. Um, one of the things that, you know, continues to be, uh, you know, part of what we do is the other portion that we face and what I lose sleep about is they really do try to slow us down. And whether that is, you know, ground threats where they have uh, improvised explosive devices, whether that's piracy, whether that's shooting at our airplanes, or whether that's cyber, there are things that we're working every day because people know that if you can slow us down logistically, you can slow us down operationally. They can also figure out that if we can figure out what we are doing logistically, you can figure out what we're going to do operationally. So lots of work, and cyber is the new world that, you know, when, when I sit there and say 33,000 attacks, we're the most attacked of any of the combatant commanders, primarily because the nature of our business, we run on a protected but not secure network. And so people are looking at that, trying to figure out what's going on, whether that's mischief to screw us up, or whether that is just finding out what we're doing, either way, we're trying to, we're working that very hard. I've spent a lot of time on piracy, you know, kind of a, you know, not, not surprising. I was just down in Bahrain last week, and my big thing there was to talk to Admiral Fox, who runs the piracy effort down in the, in the Gulf region, you know, and, and we're going to have a big meeting between Mered and industry and the Navy, um, and bring everybody together and say, okay, are we doing the best practices? Are we arming this, you know, are we arming where we need to arm, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, so that's, really, that's really been a very good whole of government approach to that to make sure we get that right. Okay, let me very quickly talk a little bit about the challenges operationally that, again, if you think of that as background, when you think, I always tell folks, if you wanted to pick a country, one country, and say, we're going to give you a check ride, and we're going to see if you can do this, you can pretty much do anything. Afghanistan would have probably been the country you would pick up. Landlocked, surrounded by high mountains. No, let me check that. The highest mountains in the world. And then has some very, very interesting neighbors. So I can bring this country up as an interesting neighbor. So when you look at that and you say, okay, how are we going to resupply Afghanistan? We were primarily coming up the Pakistan locks. We would have a ship come in. Karachi, and we'd come in. We had two major border crossings, Shaman Gate and the Torkham Gate, that we would then flow the stuff through. And when I took over, we were doing about 20% of our stuff by air, uh, a little higher than normal. Normally, we do about 10% worldwide by air. We were doing 20% because we were taking everything of va high value, everything lethal, all of that we were taking in by air. Everything that, you know, the lower value stuff we took in by surface through Pakistan. Uh, when Secretary Gates, as, uh, when he handed me the flag to Transcom, he quoted Alexander the Great as part of his final portion of his speech. He said, my logisticians are a humorous lot. They know if my campaign fails, they will be the first ones I will slay. And then he said, good luck, Duncan, and came to bring me the flag. <laughs> and I'm going... I think, could we talk about this Slade Clause just a little bit longer? I mean, well, you know, figuratively, what are you talking about here? But what, what he's basically, just like Alexander the Great, who went into Afghanistan like a number of uh, empires before, they basically went in there and found out that, okay, you know, fighting's hard in there. Logistically, it is really hard. So based on that, one of the things we said is perhaps we want to expand on what we're doing on the pack clock. So I will just say that one of the things that we did is we started working and said, can we open up the north? Can we open up the way, quite frankly, Russia came in right down, right down this way, right in, uh, right into Harrington, which is right on the border of Uzbekistan and so forth. So we started off visiting Central Asia. We worked with our U.S. flag carriers said, hey, how would you, if we wanted to bring in stuff from the north, how would we do that? And they started saying, well, here's some, here's some ways. Here's how we would do it. This is commercially. We have commercial partners that do this. And we started off with going through and talking, and here's Azerbaijan. We started off with a caucus route. Came in through, through the Black Sea. Here's Georgia. Here's Baku. Come on on up through Kazakhstan on down. So I visited here. I visited Kazakhstan. I visited Uzbekistan on that first trip. And I just remember drinking a lot of vodka for the team. 
And I started talking to them about what they really did understand the value of trade. And they understood, and they understood the power of using our US commercial flag. I said, well, we'd like to move commercial type goods using our normal commercial carriers. All the commercial pay the normal fees, all of that. And if you can do that, you would be helping us in Afghanistan. And they said, first, peace and stability is in our interest. If peace or, if, I'm sorry, peace and stability in Afghanistan is in our interest. And we'd like to help that. And we also understand the foundation of trade on raising all boats. So they understood that right from the beginning. So we had that, and we started off with that. And it was amazing. But Russia came very quickly and said, we are ready to help. We would like to do this as well. One of the first, you know, after they had gone into Georgia, it was the first time they went to the chairman. His counterpart said, you know, we'd, we'd be interested in helping as well. Because peace and stability in Afghanistan is in our interest as well. So then we started, and we had two routes that came in. And then over time, we just continued to build them. Then we built a route that came through Kyrgyzstan. And Blano, that was uh, some of your doing as we went through and uh, did that. And so we had some alternatives. Then we kept building, had one that came in from Europe, uh, you know, th through, uh, came on down through Turkey and came across. And over time, it just kept building. Brought in all of the Baltic countries where we'd started with one. All of them played. And pretty soon, you had a network. Network includes now Siberia. They come into Vladivostok, and we come across Siberia and come down. So what you've built now is a very robust network in which lots of countries are playing. They understand that their network, they, get, they, they, they compete for, uh, for, uh, for us to move uh, our cargo on their stuff. And, uh, and it's based on performance. And it's also based on rates. And rates have come down about 20%. just shows you the value of competition. We continue to do this. And today, we do about 35% uh, by air, with 35% uh, on the northern distribution and 90% on the pack lot from 80%. So you can imagine the difference that's made in our ability to make sure General Petraeus feels like I've got kind of a diversified way of getting in there. Uh, one of the reasons that air went up is we started doing a thing called multimodal ops, where we took things by surface and then just jumped them in. And that basically paid a lot of dividends, and I'll show you that. So with that as background, when the president said, OK, I want to move 30,000 troops into Afghanistan, at the same time we've been told by 31 August we would bring 80,000 troops out of Iraq, I remember in the whole discussion of you know, how many fo would he would he approve any forces going in. You probably remember this a year ago, November, big discussion about what they would do. And I remember the White House asking me to come in and tell them, what would I need if the president decided to move some additional forces in? And you could imagine that you know, I said, well, I'm going to need some additional bases. I'm going to need some additional throughput in Afghanistan. Uh, I'd like some more multimodal ports where I can bring surface and transload to air. You know, so I told them in general, and they said, and I, and I was, you know, I kind of gave them some specific targets that I thought would, would work. And they go, would you, do you really need all of that? That tends to be what Washington asks you. When you ask them to do something, they will ask you again, do you really want us to do that? And I go, well, I just said I did. But in this case, you can imagine if, in hindsight, I said, well, let me, let me just tell you, I know we're going to need some excess capacity because things will happen. Don't know what they'll be, but things will happen. For instance, the president just might compress the timeline from 16 months to nine months. Instead of giving us 16 months that we need to move that force, he may say, I need you to move that in nine. That could happen. That did happen. We could also, in the middle of this flow, right at the beginning, we may have an earthquake in the Caribbean, and it may devastate an island. Let's make it Haiti. And in fact, it may be in the interest of the country, and the president may say, I want you to go help the people of Haiti. That could happen. Or we could have a volcanic eruption. Let's make it in Iceland. I know. Let's make it shut down the airspace in Europe for three weeks. That could happen. Or those MATVs that were speeding to the theater to save lives, instead of the 500 that I said I can do and still do this other thing, you just might ask us to do 1,000. That could happen. Or you could have an oil spill in the southeast United States. Now, let's make it the most devastating oil spill in our history. And you may ask us to speed whatever equipment we can from around the world to make sure we've done everything possible to mitigate that oil spill. That could happen. 
or you could have a flood. Let's make it a flood in Pakistan where you're bringing the military equipment across. Let's make it in July and August where we're bringing the most equipment through Pakistan. Let's have, the, let's have a flood. No, let's make, it, let's make it the worst flood in their history. That could happen. And they would have said, you know, all those things aren't going to happen over the next year. And I would say, they didn't. They happened over nine months. <laughs> and here that is, as you go right on through, all of the things that happened. And 31 August, not one time did I ever get anybody, and I never heard from the president, said, hey, by the way, that 31 August, you can take a little bit more on that. Not once. Nobody ever offered. And all I kept hearing was about the Slade Clause. You know, remember the Slade Clause? Just remember that, McNabb. Keep that stuff rolling. But I would just tell you, it was incredible in our ability to move and match and make sure that happened because we, we got the forces out of Iraq. We got the forces into uh, Afghanistan. And I still remember they, we, we got 31 August. You know, I talked to her. I said, okay, do we get everything in? And STDC came back and says, we got everything but one piece of equipment. And there was a problem with the airplane, so uh, we'll get that in, you know, probably 12 hours on the 1st. And I went, okay, so you want me to tell the president that we got everything in except for this one thing, and that's what you want me to say. Because I'd really like to make it a much shorter sentence, like, yes, we got everything in. So sure enough, we got that last piece in, and it, it all worked. But I would just tell you, it, it showed you the ability of that team to be able to come together. So here's that, here's that intermodal op, and I'll just sh show you the value of this. And this is, this is for all the bankers in here, because this, this will make sense. So here, the way we were doing moving MATVs, first you think about this. Every one of these goes in, protects our, our great soldier, sailors, marine, and airmen. So this is life-saving. So we basically, we take it in. We take it in by commercial. We took it in by N-124s and C-5s and C-17s. And the average cost of moving one of those MATVs all by air was 140000 so we said, well, if you want us to go to 1,000, we'd like to do a multimodal where we take it by ship from Charleston, take it into Bahrain. We will put our, our uh, port opening teams here and down in an airfield down here. They will accept it. We'll convoy across to the airfield, and then we'll just use C-17s to fly out of uh, Sheikh Isa, and they will then fly into these different places. Now, by doing that, we save for 1,000 MATVs $110 million a month. Not bad. I mean, even in New York City, that 110 million is not bad. So I would just say, you know, here, here we sat, but it was even more valuable than that because every C-17 now we could put, because they were doing the shorter legs, we could put five MATVs on every sortie rather than three. So the throughput increased, so we got the stuff in faster than it would have at a much reduced cost. This is the value of multimodal, and that's what we're doing now in a number of locations, and it's making, it, it's, it's huge dividends. And that's what Transcom brings, and we work, we've got our first ones uh, going through Dubai where it's all commercial. A commercial sea lift carrier working with commercial air carriers are all working together to come up with a way that they offer me a, a rate between them. And this has never been done before. It's kind of exciting. So it's really, really gone well. I will just say that uh, we called it March Madness, but when Libya, when you think about Libya, you think about Japan, you think about what we're already doing around the world. If you think about the president going to South America, all of those things were happening very rapidly, and we were having to pivot the enterprise to be able to take care of all the requirements. And the ability to do that to include how commercial uh, came up on, online, especially on our air side, was unbelievable. So I would just say that those are the things that I tell folks, is we want to be able to when that warfighter out there needs something, they know that we will pivot that enterprise very rapidly to take care of them. Um, our job is, to, in fact, to get the warfighter to the fight, sustain them while they're there, also do rapid maneuver. Uh, you can see the patient, patient movement, but I'll say, if I, if I said force maneuver, I brought up the Bahrain example, but it'll give you, let me give you a sense of that. I talked how much you saved. Well, to handle that operation for the states required 40 C-17s going back and forth, if you did it all C-17s. By doing it by multimodal, I could do four. That freed up C-17s that then I could use for airdrop, and we did two million pounds of airdrop in 2005. We are headed to do 100 million pounds of airdrop this year. That's what you've done, is you've freed up the assets to go do other things that only the military can do. So that's what we're after. We'll continue to work that. 
and then, of course, bring them home. But the bottom line is nobody cares how this works. They just know if they've got it or they don't. You know, I think about FedEx, I think of UPS. They do not care about why you didn't get it there. They only care that you did it or you didn't. So that's our promise to our folks is we'll get her done. I always said that we view our success through the eyes of the warfighter. It is those people that are out there that I support, General Petraeus, General Mattis, the J General Keene, who was down in Haiti. That's, that's, that's who's got to grade me. And I used to say that, and they finally came up with this slide that said, you know, hey, this is what you say. So they made this, but I really like this because those are pretty cool shades. So that's what you get to have if you go out, you know, go out there. They, you know, they, they, we didn't have cool shades when I signed up. They were really dorky. So this is, we've really come a long way. But at the end of this, we know that we have a soldier, sailor, marine, or airman, he or she, that it's at the end of that line. Or it could be, you know, one of these refugees, one of these people that are, are a victim, a flood victim, or an earthquake, or tsunami victim. They are depending on us to make sure that we get them what they need. So that is our promise to them, is that we will always, always deliver. So when, I'll, I'll just tie this back, think about 9-11, Think about this time in our history, our ability to make sure that the last thing that Osama bin Laden saw was that the Americans had come. We want people around the world that might think about being our adversary, we want them to know that we will come. And I want the warfighters to know that we'll make sure they never have to worry about their logistics side. And that gives them tremendous flexibility because we can support them better at 8,000 miles and their opponents can support them from 300 miles. That's what we're after. And we'll continue to do that. My thanks for getting to, be, getting to come here to the Wings Club, uh, tell you a little bit about Transcom. And I, I appreciate you letting me talk a little bit about 9-11. Uh, it's very special to me, especially when I come back here. Uh, I am very honored to be here with you. The passion that you all bring, especially on the aviation side, is what has led this country to one of its greatest advantages. And it is the, our transportation infrastructure. It is our transportation network. That's the productivity that has fueled this country and its competitiveness. So the fact that you continue to do that, I do get to fly the C-17, so I still get to fly. And, and uh, every time I do, I think about how much fun I know all of you when you tell me stories about flying 130s or wherever in those times when you went. A lot of it times when you scared the hell out of yourself. I mean, those are the ones that I always remember. But I would just end with one of the greatest things I could do is go fly with our young folks. And I'll go down to Altus, and I'll get with those young guys that have been out there flying. And they've flown all these combat hours in Afghanistan and doing spiral downs and lots of airdrop. And I come over there, and I've got, you know, 5,600 hours and lots of it in airdrop and a lot of that in special ops. And those young guys will come over and put their arm around me and say, come on over here, son. Let me show you how we fly an airplane. <laughs> they are awesome. So that's what you all get to do. And uh, again, great to be with you. God bless you. Thanks.